done the three fox hunting books. Um, I have, regrettably, have not read all of your other works, although I have tried. Um, I liked your Dolly Madison book. I brought a copy of it along today because I wanted to ask you about why you wrote that one. I thought that thing was great fun. I think if Dolly and James had not been married to one another, we might have lost the country. Ah, during uh, 18th, the war there? I think it was such a bitter and brutal time. The New England states had gathered to secede from the Union at the Hartford Convention, something they rarely teach you in your history books because there was a precedent for secession. That's true. And the only thing that uh, saved it is they voted to secede because they, their trade was being ruined. All those good old New England shippers, you know. It was what, the British embargo? Yeah. The, I mean, the blockade? Yeah. Yeah. They weren't able to get their goods out to, to, to Europe, and they didn't really give a darn. So they wanted to secede so they could still do business with the enemy, so to speak. And um, they passed it. And a few days after that convention, remember, it takes days for information for to, news, to reach. Right. Andrew Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans. Oh, that's right, he did, right? didn't he? And their careers were cooked. That was the end of those political careers. And they couldn't deny they'd been at the convention. Right. You know. But it had become moot, actually, yeah. hadn't it, by the, by the Jackson? What was that, 18, was that 14. 1814? 1814. And then the, the treaty, was it the Treaty of Paris that ended that? I think it was in 1814. And, and th these two, here was James Madison having to prosecute a war, which he never wanted in the first place, right. forced on him by the young Turks of Webster, Calhoun, and Clay. And it was they, called Mr. Madison's War, which was so yeah, unfair. And he hated it. Right. And he's, he's married to a woman who's a Quaker, <laughs> who's against war and against slavery. You know, and here he is, a slave owner, which tortured him his whole life, actually. Um, and she, they held together. It was, a very, uh, it was a very sexually exciting marriage. It was a very intellectually exciting marriage, too, even though there was, what, 17 years between them, I think. Was that that much? It, it was that. a big gap. Yeah. And he was not a very impressive specimen. I and mean, He was a little fellow. He was little, wasn't he? Skinny. Right. Not very handsome. And she was a babe. I mean, right. She made men crazy. And, uh, and they... And they held together, and they got through this dreadful time. And I think had he been married to a weak woman uh, or someone that wasn't willing literally to die on the steps of what was then called just the president's mansion uh, for, for that Constitution and Declaration of Independence, I don't, I'm not sure we'd be here. But she was an exciting person to write about. She was exciting. Also, she saw her mother stand up to one of Tarleton's raiders during the Revolutionary War, they came up the James River. And uh, Tarleton, who was actually a marvelous officer, sent out raiding parties all up and down the James and was torching that part of Virginia and looking for Henry, uh, 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 not Henry Clay, uh, Patrick. Patrick Henry. Yeah, Patrick Henry. Because the, he was a traitor and they wanted to hang him. They wanted to make an example out of him. Well, Dolly's mother was his cousin. Patrick Henry's cousin. So she had taken the house that he'd rented and was just trying to keep body and soul together because her husband, Dolly's father, just couldn't rub two nickels together. I mean, he was useless in terms of money. And one of these raiders came up, a colonel with a whole regiment behind him, came down the long farm road, his sword brandish, and calls out, give me Henry. And she says, he's not here. The mother says, he's not here. And she had hidden the children in the back with uh, the nanny, who, of course, was a slave. And, um, or, or a, a servant. They, they didn't believe in slavery. They were Quakers, but she was black. And in essence, I doubt she was paid very much. But um, Dolly snuck out and snuck into the house and was down the hall and saw the colonel ride up the steps, draw his sword on her mother, and saw her mother defy him, not knowing whether she would be killed or not. And the mother looks up at the colonel and says, he's not here get out of my hallway, look what you're doing to the wood because of the horseshoes was cutting into the wood. And the man was so undone <laughs> that he hadn't terrified this woman. And furthermore, she was talking to him like his own mother. He turned around and rode off. And I often think that Dolly fulfilled her mother's courage in that moment when the British were literally three blocks away from the White House and she wouldn't go. She said, they're going to have to kill me. And it took two men to drag her out. She was an amazing woman, absolutely true. Were we lucky in our founding fathers? I, I don't know if there will ever be a constellation of such intellects or spirits again, including the women they were married to. I Abigail think. Adams, right. 
what Martha did for George. I mean, she never gets any credit. I mean, she did everything. She was, in essence, running a corporation, that big farm. Absolutely and, true. And keeping, keeping But there was a man who could have been king, and, you know, it never seemed to occur to him that, you know, I mean, you really think about what he could have had if he wanted. And, Hamilton. And rejected. All of them. Well, Hamilton, I, I've always thought that was, I'll never forgive Aaron Burr. I really still ticked off about that. And the funny thing, it's funny that you bring that up, and it's one of the things that kept coming to me in this Dolly book, is John Tyler was the last, I guess he was the 10th president, was the last who knew these people fairly right. well. And when he died, many people said, it's a new generation now, and they're out for themselves. And then that was the generation of Webster, Clay, and Calhoun, where the ego, even though they were brilliant men, the right. ego was everything. Whereas these men certainly had egos, but were able to put it in the service of a great cause. And if you think about it, from that time to today, we've had very few public servants, particularly as president, who were able to live up to the founding fathers, not just an intellectual example, emotional example. I think that's true, and also with that custodial view, Harry Truman may have been the only one in the 20th century who really understood that it was the office. And you know, there's a famous line about him when he left the White House and went back to Missouri, and somebody interviewed him and said, you know, what, what was the first thing you did, you know, when you went back to Independence? And he said, I took the suitcases up to the attic. That was it, you know. Um, it was so, he really did get it, you know, that, that it hadn't been about him. Mm -hmm. Although he had some fiery moments in office, nonetheless, he let it go. Uh, and I think, I think that's been very difficult for, for other presidents. And, and I've always admired that about Washington, that he did the two terms and he, you know, he let it go. Um, went on home. Um, and I've often stood in the court, many times I've stood in the courthouse in, in Richmond and tried to, you know, imagine that trial with, you know, um, John Marshall and, and the whole bit. I mean, Richmond is a fabulous city. It's, well, the uh, State House was one of, I think it was Jefferson's first public commission. It's very, very simple. It is simple. And then you go to Charlottesville and look at the university, and I mean, there's just, it's just all drenched in history. But you're right, it does give you a feeling like you're walking in the footsteps of giants. And but if Dolly and James were to come back today, I think there are many things that they'd be very proud that we've done right and that we've carried on. And I think there would be other things that they would be repelled to the marrow of their bones, at the, the self-indulgence, the crudity, particularly the crudity and um, the uh, continual enriching oneself at the public trough. You know. Well, we've become a confessional society, and you know, and one in which actually misdeeds are celebrated, and that was not, well, um, well no, no literary discussion with you could possibly be complete without asking you about the Ruby Fruit Jungle. You wrote that in 1973. Was that your first book? No, it was my, it was my second book. I had two books of, po well, I had two books of poetry and a book of political essays some of which I'd written when I was 18. And then, but Ruby Fruit was the first novel. And um, it was, it's, I got $1,000 for it. Nobody would publish it. Big advance. Yeah. Was Molly kind of a, kind of a you character? No, but Gloria Steinem said that, and it sort of stuck. I mean, sure, we have some, some things in, in common. We both grew up in the country, and we're both a little bit insouciant, if you will. But I think Molly, in many ways, was, uh, a much nicer person than I am, because <laughs> uh, I can I can lose my temper. I can have my fiery moments, like Truman too. Uh, but she was an interesting character because, in a sense, she she very early learned who she was and accepted. And that's so hard for people. I don't care what their sexuality is or what their race is or whatever. For whatever reason, it's so hard for people to accept who they are. Well. Yeah, it is, and also to do it young. I mean, I think as a teenager, that's a really tough. So many people seem to be much older before they ever get to grips with it, you know, figuring it out. I didn't know who I was, but in a different sense. I mean, I always knew what my sexual orientation was, but I didn't have any real idea what sort of what I wanted to do until I was actually in my 40s. Who knew? It just, I, just, I, I think it's because I had too many things I could do. I think I was spoilt for choice. Huh. That's, that's amazing. Well, maybe, that, maybe that's true of a lot of people, but I just sort of look at them and want to say, you're perfect. Why are you worried? You're perfect. You know, if you want to go out and be an external success, okay, you have to make a series of decisions to do that. But you as you, you're fine.